Welcome, everyone. This is Building UIs in the Dark. I'm Richard Feldman. Um, this is my first time in Sweden, and uh, so far I've learned a couple things. One is the saunas are very warm, very nice. Two is the Baltic Sea is very cold in November. Uh, so I'd recommend the first thing, not sure about the second thing. Um, all right, so let's imagine that you sit down at your computer, your laptop, and you have your hands over your keys, and this is what you see. Nothing. Just pitch blackness. So this is what programming is like for this particular programmer. If you look at his desk here, you might notice that there's a keyboard and, uh, and there's headphones, standard programming equipment. There's something missing that, that you and I might be used to. There's no monitor. There's no display. And uh, this is because this particular developer is blind. And he wrote this blog post. It's absolutely fascinating. I highly recommend reading it on his company's blog um, called Software Development at 450 Words Per Minute. And he explains how he programs. And basically, what he hears in those headphones is text-to-speech, reading code to him really, really fast. I'm going to do my impersonation of this. I mean, you have no idea. If you listen to it, it just sounds like absolute gibberish. It's like, I don't know how he has learned to, to listen to this this fast. But he's actually productive doing this. And, uh, and you know, if you imagine, like, what is flow state like for him? Like that's different from flow state for us. Flow state, when you really get in the zone, you're just kind of letting the code flow through you. This, is, this has got to be a completely different experience. And yet, he also gets into flow state, same way as we do. This really fascinated me. He said, I've had my fair share of Angular and React work. If you're not a front-end developer, these are front-end programming technologies for the web. So he's doing UI development blind. And you might think, like, what? Well, how? I mean, <laughs> it's UI work. How, how could you possibly do that, like, completely in the dark like this? And it turns out that he's like, well, you know, many web apps today have a lot going on under the hood. It's not all layout and visual stuff. There's actually quite a lot of business logic that lives in the client of a web application now. And this actually didn't always used to be the case. Like, back in the days before web apps, what some might call the good old days, um, we used to have uh, basically just static HTML only. It was all content. That was it. No interactivity, really. Not, not on the client side. I mean, JavaScript existed, but it was like too slow for more than just like making stuff follow your mouse around for some reason. Um, and really, people were on like dial-up connections at best. Like 56K was like, yeah, that, that's a good modem right there. Um, so the, the idea of making a web app back then was just kind of a non-starter. So the beginnings of web apps really were sort of like still rendering HTML, but it was sort of doing it dynamically, on the fly, on the server. And that kind of sort of, oh, hey, we can, we can actually do this. And then JavaScript got fast. And it's like, oh, we can, we can do more with JavaScript. And uh, bandwidth got uh, increased. And we started to see more and more broadband. And this sort of uh, led to the rise of web apps. You know, we, we started to see really rich web applications, things like the idea of, of a map application in the browser with no flash. I mean, back in the 90s, that would have been completely absurd. But now we're just like, oh, yeah, that's, you know, I, I do that on my phone, right? Running on smartphones, which didn't even exist back in the early days. The de development ecosystem has really matured. It's come a long way for, for building client-side web applications. And servers have gotten a lot cheaper. And of course, as you might imagine, this has sort of uh, changed the nature of what front-end code looks like, like, especially as a percentage of code based over time. Like, it's just phew, absolutely taken off. I mean, the, the, the amount of front-end code that we write today relative to how much we did back in the days when everything was on the server is just skyrocketed. And we've even gotten to the, the point where people are talking about things like event sourcing. Actually, I've done this at work in, in some cases. The idea behind web, uh, event sourcing is you basically log user actions, like user clicks on a thing. You essentially just send that straight to the server, and the server doesn't really do anything. It just writes it down in a database. And then you can sort of replay those events later on to restore the user state. At this point, you're basically saying all of the logic is on the front end. The server is not doing anything. It's just spitting stuff straight into a database and then spitting it back out to the front end, which takes care of restoring the state completely and managing everything. Now, uh, the complexity of front end has also been affected by this, as you might imagine, as the percentage of the code base goes up. And that's also been, actually, no, it's been more than that. I mean, it's just been straight up. It's absolute, I mean, it's, it's completely absurd how complicated front end code bases have gotten. And so we've, you know, uh, there's this natural question that comes with this, like, how do we deal with all this complexity? Well, one answer is, uh, is the, what I've done at work, um, at this company I work for, No Red Ink. Um, we used to be using React, uh, and now we've been using this technology called Elm. So if you're not familiar with Elm, Elm is a functional programming language that compiles to JavaScript. And we've been using it to help us manage our complexity problems. Um, 
it's got its own semantics. It's, it's not actually JavaScript under the hood. It's not even a JavaScript dialect. It has absolutely nothing to do with JavaScript, except for the fact that it compiles to it. So we can use it on the client. So lots of companies using Elm, all sorts of different sizes. The ones on the left you may be familiar with. The ones in the middle may be less likely to be familiar with. The ones on the right uh, even less likely because they're sort of smaller companies. So big, little, and small. Uh, it works for all shapes and sizes. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, people had been asking for quite some time was, uh, hey, is there uh, any sort of single page application example so I can see what an SPA looks like in Elm? And for a while there wasn't one because people would say, well, yes, we've got plenty of them. They're all proprietary, you can't see them. Um, so people were asking for an open source one and I found out about this project called Real World. And it's pretty cool. The basic idea behind Real World is they have a specification for a client as well as a server. And so you can implement it using different technologies. You can use React, Elm, Angular for the front end, whatever you want. Also on the back end, you can use Django or Laravel or whatever um, you know, back end technology you want. So you can see the sort of like mix and match of these different technologies. And it's a, it's a pretty sizable single page app example. It's, it's got uh, it's sort of like a medium clone, although they called it conduit instead of medium. Huh? Conduit, medium, okay. Um, and the basic idea is you've got uh, you know, enough functionality to sort of demonstrate what a single page app might look like in each of these different technologies. So you've got stuff like you can write posts, you can view a feed, you can look at tags, you can edit your settings, log in, log out, sign in, sign up, all that good stuff. So here's, uh, if, you're, if you want to take a look at this particular one later, uh, that's the URL. So um, a couple years ago, I was on this uh, flight where I was working on this. And uh, you know, if you're like me, you think four hour flight and you're like, that's not a flight, that's a four hour coding party. Yes, there's going to be no distractions. I can't check Twitter. Uh, you know, there's, there's no Wi-Fi. That's a feature. If, if, you know, if the plane doesn't have Wi-Fi, or it's like, that's $20. I can't afford $20, so I'm going to have no choice but to focus on one thing for the whole time, which will be great. Um, so I was really excited about this. I'm like, yes, I'm going to work on this thing. And that, that happened to be the project I was working on. So I was really looking forward to this until I realized there's a slight problem, which is that um, if you're offline and uh, every single page load begins with an HTTP request to a third-party service that I don't control and isn't on my laptop, uh, that means I can't use the browser <laughs> for any of this four-hour coding session, um, which if you're doing UI development is usually a bit of a hindrance. Um, so this is sort of the problem I was faced with, and I was like, ah, oh, there goes my coding party. I was like, okay, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll just like write some code and I'll see how far I can get. Um, and it turns out, four hours later, I, <laughs> the plane's landing, and, uh, and I have Wi-Fi again, and it's like, yeah, I was just coding the entire time, uh, as it turns out. I, I was able to be productive for the entire four hours writing Elm code. And when I landed and got the Wi-Fi back, everything that I had built worked on the first try when I had Wi-Fi again. Now, when I tell people this story, I get two different reactions, commonly. Um, if, if the person I'm talking to has used Elm before, they're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know, I've been there, right? That's, that's good stuff. And then if the person has not used Elm before, they're like, I don't believe you. That's not, that's not a true story. That could not have happened. Um, because it's, it's kind of implausible, right? I mean, front-end development, right? We're talking about building UIs, again. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's implausible that you could do front-end work for four hours, no internet connection, not be able to use the browser, um, and still be productive. Um, so I thought, you know, uh, what better way to, to demonstrate what I'm talking about than to do it live on stage? Um, so let's actually add a feature to this without opening the browser. So uh, you're going to sort of see, get a feel for uh, at least a, a small taste of, of what type of stuff I was doing on this flight. So here we see on the left, um, this is uh, sort of the, the My Articles uh, tab on, on your feed. So you can click My Articles and see a list of all the articles that you've written. Here's a article that I've theoretically written that just says hello to everyone. Um, and you can see there's another tab over there called favorited articles. And when you click favorited articles, it shows you other people's articles that you've clicked favorited on. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to add that feature, the, the favorited articles feature. So I've got a build where I've uh, sort of taken that out, and we're just going to go through adding it right here in the editor live. All right. OK. Now the first rule of doing live coding is that uh, you make sure that you have everything in your cache, right? So like, uh, you never want to do like rm-rf, uh, the equivalent of like Elm stuff, which is like the equivalent of node modules. You never want to. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Um, <coughs> well, let's just see. You know, maybe I can run this build, and it, maybe it won't take too long to. Oh, that was fast. Okay. Um, so one thing to note about Elm. It's really fast, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's also really good at caching stuff. So um, 
all the like downloaded modules and stuff uh, I have there just happen to be in my local cache already anyway. So when I'm building from scratch, even if I have you know, my project-specific cache deleted, it's no big deal. It, uh, it can rebuild it very quickly. OK, so we have right here, um, I'm not going to talk too much about what this code is doing while I'm live coding it, because I have slides that are sort of explaining in more depth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first go through this and kind of show you the process, and then we're going to talk through in more depth in the slide and kind of explain what I've been doing. OK, so we have this function called view tabs. We have right here my articles, so that corresponds to the one that we've already got. What we're going to do is we're going to add favorited articles. I already have that in my clipboard, so I don't have to type it out. So I'm <laughs> just going to hit Save. And now I'm going to rebuild. Um, by the way, I'm going to throw a quick time on this build. And uh, we're going to see that it was able to give me an error message in 0.226 seconds. So that was pretty quick. So that's a, that's a pretty quick feedback loop there before I, I know what I need to do next. It says, naming error. I cannot find a favorited articles constructor. And you can see it's, it's underlined up here in my editor. So I have you know, editor tooling that's going to give me the full error. I'm doing it down here in the console so you can sort of see the, uh, the raw thing if you were just running it uh, from the CLI. Can I find a favorited articles constructor? These names seem close, though. OK. Well, it's telling me that I don't have one of those because it doesn't exist. I just made it up. And all I'm going to do through the rest of this time is just follow the errors that I get from having added this new thing and sort of pretending that favorited articles is already a concept that exists. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, so favorited articles, I happen to know that's going to be one of my feed types. Currently, I only have one of those defined, which is my articles. So I'm just going to right click, hit go to definition, and say, OK, I need to add some feed articles right here. All right, or favorited articles, rather. Favorited articles. OK, great. So we've got that added. Now uh, let's rebuild, see what happens. OK, once again. 0.222 seconds. We have our next feedback. Missing patterns. By the way, this is about 4,000 lines of code. So these are, these are not compiling, you know, hello world exactly. Um, this case does not have branches for all possibilities. OK. And then we have a second error down here, which is another missing pattern. This other case does not have branches for all possibilities. So you can see the line number here on the left, 116. So I'm going to hop over there. And again, if I were just doing all this in my editor, I would probably just be hitting next error. But I'm going to do it with the, uh, the console just to show that. OK, now I happen to know that uh, the way that I'm going to solve this is I'm going to add another branch here. Uh, instead of my articles, it's going to be favorited articles. And I know that the only thing I'm going to change here, this is going to be the part that actually goes and does the HTTP request. Instead of going to the author URL, I'm going to go to the favorites URL. OK, notice when I hit save, by the way, the, the white space changed a little bit. Um, I'm using Elm format on save, and Elm format is a cool thing that basically formats your code. So whenever I save, it just whoop, makes it look nice. Um, this is a feature that. Pretty much everybody I know who uses Elm uses. And one of the cool things about it is that it has no configuration, which means your team can't argue about it. <laughs> There's only one way to use it, which is you just run it. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, OK, so that, uh, let's see if that fixed one of our errors. Sure enough, it did. We're now down to one missing patterns error. It's line 287. OK, and we see we're back down here. I'm going to create a little bit of code duplication. Then when we get to the slides, I'm going to resolve it. Um, so my article is going to change that to favorited articles. And uh, I happen to know that basically what this is doing right here is it's showing which of these two tabs is selected versus not. And I'm going to shuffle these around a little bit because I want my articles to be not selected. And I want favorite articles to be selected, the selected one. Selected one goes in the middle. OK, so now I have fixed that. And now, boom. Successful compile, and it successfully compiled it and generated all of the code, the output, in 0.3 seconds. Now, this is an incremental build, so we know that this is now safe, so I guess I've, I've kind of uh, spoiled that. But I can RM my local cache and build it again completely from scratch, and that brings it all, all the way up to one second. So that's a complete scratch build. Incremental, obviously, is much faster than that. So you can imagine, if this were a much bigger than 4,000 line of code code base, um, this is still quite a nice feedback loop to have. Uh, and in fact, when I was pair programming with one of my coworkers a while ago, um, we, <laughs> we were going back and forth and doing this and just kind of being like, oh, error, fix it, error, fix it, error, fix it, and sort of like going through the code base and you know, working out the implications of the change we'd made. And then we finally went back to the browser and, and hit refresh and actually like used it. He looks at me, he's like, this is so slow, waiting for the browser to load. Like that takes like way more than a second. Wow. Oh, how did I ever live like this? It's like, yeah, this is pretty cool. It's actually, this is faster, <laughs> it turns out. A faster way to do UI development. OK, so as promised, now let's actually go through that in a little bit more depth and kind of talk through um, what these things are doing. OK, so, so initially, the goal was just add a new feed, a new tab, a favorited articles feed. Um, so we had this code initially. This is a sort of feed.view tabs. And it's got three arguments here. And basically, the, the square brackets are a list, and then the uh, 
the parentheses are a tuple. It's like two pieces of information. So basically what we're saying here is uh, we have no selected tabs to the left of the selected tab. Selected tab goes in the middle, and then we have a list of additional tabs. There are no selected tab, uh, unselected tabs after it. So what I did was I added an unselected tab after it. So my articles is selected, and then we have an unselected one after it. And that was where we got our first error. It's squiggly underline indicating, hey, this is not a thing. You have not actually uh, created that yet. And specifically, it said naming error. I cannot find a favorited articles constructor. And it uh, underlined it as well in the CLI, but you know, the editor is a little bit nicer. Um, and so uh, now we know from this error, hey, you know what? Our next step is uh, we need to actually define this thing. We need to create a thing so that we're not going to get this error. So the next thing we did is I, I did go to definition. I said, OK, um, I want to define a new type of feed tab. So we have one called My Articles. I'm going to uh, make a new one called Favorited Articles. And as soon as I did that, it said, hey, missing patterns. This case does not have branches for all possibilities. So we had a, a case in which I was using My Articles. And it's saying, OK, anytime you have a case, a case is a form of conditional. And whenever you're doing a uh, case on one of these things, these custom types, it makes, makes you sort of not forget to handle all the different possibilities. So because we introduced a new possibility, in addition to my articles, we said, yeah, now there's a new thing called feed articles that says, OK, I'm glad that you introduced that. But over here, I have this conditional that only has some of the possibilities specified. You need to specify all of them. You need to tell me what to do if I get one of those values in here. I'm like, OK, yeah, fair enough. And then it also tells me, oh, by the way, the missing possibilities include favorited articles. That's the one that I'm missing. Like, OK, cool. And it further goes on to explain, I would have to crash if I saw one of those because I don't know how to handle it. And as we'll see later, Elm's really big on not crashing. Um, this is OK, so like, just add some branches for them. So this is my compiler error, and I'm like, OK, what's my next step? Oh, yeah, I add branches for them. <laughs> so sure enough, that's the next thing I did. Um, said, OK, I'm going to add a favorite articles branch to this case. And that looks like this. As previously mentioned, um, I happen to know that this is the one that uh, works on the endpoint. So it's not just you know, mechanical, just do exactly what the compiler says. I do have to still have some knowledge of the system. But when I was on this plane flight, I, I mean, I did know, have knowledge of the system. So I knew what to do in this case, which is to say, OK, I've specified the HTTP request that this feed is going to use when it's loading the data. In the first case, it's like, oh, go get the author endpoint. And here, I'm like, OK, I need to go get the, the favorited endpoint instead. Now, this is logic that I was not allowed to forget to implement. I, I still had to know how to implement it. But the important part was that the compiler said, yeah, you need to put some logic here. I don't know what it is, but I know that there's some logic that goes here. There was no way I could forget to add that. And this is the only difference between the two. Finally, we had the last missing patterns error. Um, and you know, at this point, uh, you can sort of see a little bit, get a little bit of a taste of like the pattern of doing Elm development. Once you see enough of these errors, they sort of start to uh, break down into patterns. So like, I, I kind of know the shape of a missing patterns error. I'm like, OK, I see a missing pattern. So I know that means I forgot to add something somewhere. I'm going to jump down to the yellow highlighted thing and be like, OK, that's the thing that I need to add. And then uh, I just know that like, the, the remedy here is I need to add branches. So I get pretty fast at these things. Um, so the way that I did that in this case, uh, I said, OK, I need to add a branch of favorite articles also to the view tabs function. So this is the part where it's actually showing which one's selected and which one's not. And initially, we did this using code duplication. I just copy-pasted it um, and, uh, and just rearranged them, just shuffled them around because I wanted uh, the favorited articles wanted to be selected. And um, <clears throat> this, of course, is some code duplication. So the way we could resolve this is to extract those two common pieces of uh, logic out into top-level values and name them. So here's what that looks like. So I basically say, OK, my articles is going to be the one that has the string, my articles. And then here's what it does when you click on it. Here's favorited articles, which has a different string and does that when you click on it. And now we can see a little bit more easily how these sort of correspond to what ended up actually happening in the UI. So we had my articles on the left, favorited articles on the right. That's true in both of these. You notice that in both function calls, we have uh, my articles coming first and favorited articles coming after it. The only difference is in how they're arranged. So in this one, we said there's nothing to the left of my articles that's unselected. And the unselected stuff to the right of it is favorite articles, with the middle one being selected. And then here, we just had the same number of arguments, but they're in a different order. So my articles is unselected, favorite articles is selected, and there's nothing unselected after it. OK. So for our flight lands, I've just done the same kind of stuff that we did there. Open the browser, and it all worked. Awesome. OK. So. Not every feature gets this much help, to be fair. I mean, like th this was a pretty straightforward feature to implement. I could just make one change, say, pretend that this thing exists, and then just follow all the implications such that uh, it, would, it would go through and it would all work. Not every feature gets quite that much help, granted. But surprisingly, many of them actually do. 
Um, it's, it's actually a very common experience to get that much help, that sort of level of compiler support for what you're working on. And the reason for this is that modifying existing code, like we did here, is like pretty much the type of stuff that we do all the time. This is what I did on the flight, and this is what I do at work. It's what we spend most of our careers doing this stuff, modifying existing code. I know that like most tutorials are usually like, hey, let's build this thing from scratch. But that's really like not the type of programming we typically do. And part of the, my motivation for giving this talk is because if you're doing an Elm tutorial and you're, you're you know, working on it from scratch, it's kind of hard to see that. Like, you can't really see the benefit of like, what happens when you have a more substantial code base. To the point where I had a coworker who, uh, you know, his first experience using Elm was on our like, quarter million lines of Elm that we have at work. And then he went to a meetup later and he was like, teaching some new people Elm and he was like, it's really hard to explain how awesome this is at work like, from this tutorial. It's just, this, it's not there. Like, the stuff that's cool about this isn't visible at small scale. I was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. Um, so here we are. Um, but adding features, you know, refactoring, fixing bugs to an existing code base, that's, that's pretty much most of what it means to be a career programmer. Um, so at No Red Inc., uh, the, sort of our journey to, to get to where we have gotten, we started off back in 2015, we had a, a pretty substantial React code base and we introduced a little bit of Elm. And then, you know, it sort of grew, 2016, like Elm sort of overtook React in our code base and then it got bigger and now we're basically, we're an Elm shop. I mean, uh, <laughs> to, to do front-end programming at No Red Inc. means you're, you're basically writing Elm all day. By the way, if that sounds cool, we're hiring. Um, and uh, so, so an interesting thing that we've noticed is that uh, our Elm code uh, doesn't really do a certain thing that we got very used to uh, in JavaScript. And um, so just to give you a little bit of context, we have about five billion questions answered. We, we make an application for English teachers uh, to help them teach students writing. Um, we've got about a quarter million lines of Elm code at this point. Um, we've been running in production since 2015, about three and a half years. And um, we use Rollbar to track errors, like our, our uh, runtime exceptions. So whenever something crashes on the front end, we get a Rollbar notification about it. So this gives us a lot of insight into you know, where the sources of our crashes are. Um, so here's a graph uh, of our total production runtime exceptions. So we had about 60,000 in JavaScript since 2015. Now, I apologize, I didn't have enough uh, screen real estate here. It's not actually zero on the Elm side, it's zero pixels. It did happen, we, we did something really dumb, um, and it happened and we were very sad. Last, uh, this happened last year. Before I used to get to say we, we had zero runtime exceptions. Although weirdly, people didn't believe me. Um, Elm people were like, oh yeah, of course. But then everybody else was like, no, you're, you're, you're logging set up wrong. But now that it happened, people are like, whoa, you've only had like that, like it's almost never happened? That's, un that's, that's incredible. Um, but yeah, for real, I mean, it's like, it's not, it hasn't been literally zero, but I mean, um, it's just not something we think about anymore. Uh, we, we just kind of assume that our front end code will never crash and that assumption never burns us. Um, and I've never had that anywhere I've ever worked. I mean, I, <laughs> I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, that's never been true in any programming language I've ever used in any environment. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unusual. Um, and so you might say like, okay, well, what about like null pointer exceptions? Like surely it, at least you get NPEs, right? That's like part of programming. You can't not get NPEs. Um, but I mean, as you saw, we, we saw some examples in this live coding of, of like, cases where the compiler just makes it impossible for me to forget things, right? The missing patterns error. Like that, that was basically saying, hey, you defined a new thing, you need to handle that everywhere. Um, it wouldn't let me forget that. And um, so here's an example of, of how Elm sort of handles like null pointer errors and, and makes them impossible for me to forget handling them. So if I wrote this code in JavaScript, I wrote like an array with one, two, and three, and I said bracket zero, um, it's gonna say, okay, yeah, sure, here you go. Uh, that's gonna give you back uh, the number one. And if I did an empty array and said bracket zero, it's gonna give me back undefined. Or if I were in Ruby, it would give me back nil. Various languages do this um, in different ways, but pretty much uh, all of them either give me back uh, some sort of equivalent of null, or like in Python, they give me a, a runtime exception. Now, what Elm does is a little bit different. So Elm uses that same case expression, which we saw earlier uh, is subject to missing patterns. And in Elm, you say case list.head, and then the name, your, your list, of, and then you have two branches, nothing or just. And as we saw, if you leave off either of those branches, it's not gonna compile. It's gonna say missing patterns. Hey, you forgot one of those two possibilities. And this is just how you do these things in Elm. Like anytime you have something that's done with null or nil or undefined in, in some other language, Elm is gonna do it with these types of patterns. And as we saw, it's not, not possible to forget that. So how would you possibly get to a crashing case here? You just can't, it wouldn't compile. And 
this is sort of the, the, the key here. Um, this is how Elm gets away with not having null or undefined or nil. It just has different constructs. And as it happens, in a very happy coincidence, those different constructs don't lead to runtime crashes. They just lead to compile time errors at worst. And Elm APIs are all like this, the whole programming language. There is no null, there's no undefined in the language. It's this all the way down. The core libraries and everything that's built on top of them is like this. So this is sort of how Elm gets away with saying, hey, we don't have runtime exceptions because they're really not a thing. There's no try catch in Elm because what would you even do with that? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, yes, it's conceivably possible. You can still get a stack overflow. You can run out of memory. I mean, there, there are some cases where, you know, a, a crash is possible, um, but they're so rare, they're just like not even worth talking about, and they're just not something that Elm programmers do talk about. Um, so, so this gets to this idea of like, what if your compiler were not just like something that sort of were a gatekeeper? What if it was actually an assistant? Like, what if it was actually assisting you in writing code and helping you say, like, hey, you forgot this, you forgot this, you forgot that, and not just saying, no, you're wrong, try again. Um, I think, as, as we saw in the live coding demo, I was getting a lot more help than that. It wasn't just me saying, oh, wait a minute, all right, what did I do wrong? It was, like, telling me the next step to go to every step of the way. It was like, hey, here's what to do next, here's what to do next. Assistant. Um, so another example of this is like uh, when you make uh, typos, like you make a mistake, like it said, hey, uh, model does not have a field named profile. It's not just going to say like, so figure that out. It's going to say like, hey, um, the type of model is this, so you can go look up your type definition of model, and it says that doesn't have a field named profile. Maybe you made a typo, and in fact, there in your type definition, it's like, oh, profile, oh, I see what happened, right? It's telling me as much context as it can possibly give me about this thing. And this is something Elm's known for, is like really helpful compiler errors that are not just like well formatted, they're not just you know, giving you the bare minimum of information, they're like trying to actually assist you. Um, I'm particularly fond of this one. <laughs> it's like a little ASCII art. If you have circular dependencies, it's like, hey, uh, you may need to remove some of these things, remove them around, because right now this depends on this, which depends on this, which depends on this, and that forms a cycle. It's not gonna work out for you. Um, this one, uh, I, I should have taken a proper screenshot of this, but unfortunately I just reused it from the tweet that I saw, which was arguably not the best choice. But basically it says, this type alias is recursive, forming an infinite type. So a type alias is basically a way of saying, I want to just give a name to this type that I've already got. So when I expand a recursive type alias, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So de-aliasing results in an infinitely large type. Try this instead, and it actually gives you like, hey, here's some code that will actually compile. It says, this is kind of a subtle distinction. I suggested the naive fix, but you can often do something a bit nicer, so I'd recommend reading more at this link. So this is like a, a thing that like, the Elm compiler kind of has a personality, um, <laughs> a helpful personality. Um, and uh, the, the tweet that I copied this from is, that should be an inspiration for every error message. And this was said by a fellow you may know named John Carmack, um, who's seen quite a few error messages in his time. Um, so, so really, at the end of the day, like, the fundamental thing that Elm is sort of all about here is guarantees about you know, what, what your program uh, can do. Like, the compiler checks everything. It's not just that it's like, oh, well, you, I compiled this and this thing checked out and we have an any type here that's just sort of an escape hatch. It doesn't really have that. It just, yeah, it's, it's gonna check absolutely everything. Um, there's also no mutations. This is another thing that, that makes it sort of easier to enforce these guarantees. Elm is designed, everything is immutable. Our whole quarter million lines of code base, there's not a single mutation in there. You just can't do it. Elm doesn't have syntax for mutations. Um, also, there's no side effects. <laughs> Elm is also full of pure functions. It's like every Elm function you write has to be pure. And again, the, the compiler and the, the, the library design just guarantees that. It's pretty sweet. You might be wondering, okay, but how do you possibly build user interfaces in that way? Like, no side effects? How do you do stuff without side effects? No mutation? How do you change state without mutation? And the answer is this thing called the Elm architecture. So Elm architecture basically begins with a view function. Just gonna give you a quick like 101 of how that works. Um, and a view function is you give it some arguments and it returns some virtual DOM. So a virtual DOM is basically a description of how you want the DOM, which is to say the, the web page, to look. So give it some arguments and it says I'm just gonna return how I want the page to look. So the Elm architecture uh, is basically taking all of these ingredients, uh, three ingredients, and sending them to the Elm runtime, which is basically what the, the Elm compiler spits out on the other side and sort of uses to, to process all this stuff and make your application work. So you start with this thing called the model, and the model is basically a description of your entire application state. It's one immutable value that represents every single thing that's going on in your application. And you pass that, or, or rather the Elm runtime passes that to your view function. So it receives the model and then returns some virtual DOM because that's its whole job. So it's a pure function that takes model and returns virtual DOM. And uh, then basically the runtime 
uh, then says, okay, when I get some user interactions, I'm going to send messages to a function called update. Those messages, by the way, uh, we just created a couple of those in our uh, favorite articles example. The messages are, again, just immutable values. We define them using type. We get missing patterns if we don't handle all of them. Those get sent, uh, sorry, update gets past the model, uh, the, the current model, as well as that message, and then it looks at that and says, okay, what am I gonna do with this message? And the message will say something like, oh, the user clicked on the favorited articles tab, or the user clicked on this button, or that button, or something else happened. And it says, okay, based on that, I'm gonna return a new model that's a new description of our application state. That gets passed to view, view creates some new virtual DOM, and then the whole cycle begins all over again. So again, this is a, a very 101 kind of like high level overview. I encourage you to, to you know, take a deeper look at it. But fundamentally, this is all there is to setting up interactive applications in Elm. And our whole code base is built on this whole thing. Um, one of the cool things about that message is that it's, uh, it's subject to these same sort of making things impossible to forget uh, pattern matching rules that we saw in the live coding. So if I have like clicked dismiss arrows, clicked follow, clicked unfollow, clicked tab, feed page, all of those different things, um, I can't forget to handle any of those interactions. If I introduce a new one of these and I render it on the page, I cannot forget to wire it up to my logic. It won't compile if I forget. Likewise, I also can't put it in there and then make it so, oh, I've, I've just defined some logic here without defining what shape it has. Can't do that either. So basically it's like, um, this is a complete list of possible user actions, and I know that it's complete because any other user action I could define would require adding something to this list. Sort of a nice hidden benefit to this that one of my coworkers commented on um, is when you come into a new Elm code base, you're looking at a new page, you're like, okay, what, what can the user do on this page? You're just like, oh, that's, that's what they can do. It's right there. It's just this one nice list. It's a nice little side effect of the way things are organized in Elm. Um, Elm also has its own ecosystem. So there's no chance that we would have this much like <laughs> running in production without crashing um, if we were doing tons of stuff with JavaScript libraries. Um, but we're not, because Elm has its own package ecosystem. Everything in the Elm package ecosystem is built on top of these set of primitives with all of these guarantees. It all works that way. So it's got its own separate package manager. Everything installs very quickly. Everything compiles very quickly. All of the things on the package manager, if you want to publish it, it has to have already compiled. It has to successfully compile. Um, it also just makes sure that everything in the ecosystem maintains all of these Elm guarantees. Like Elm can do interop with JavaScript, but it's in this very restricted way and packages are not allowed to do it. So your application can interop with any third-party JavaScript libraries you want, but the whole Elm package ecosystem is all Elm code. And finally, uh, semantic versioning is actually enforced. So what that means is if I publish a library as version 1.0, and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna like delete a function and like publish that as 1.1. It's like, no, you deleted something. That's a breaking change. You have to bump the major version number. And that's enforced across every single package in the entire ecosystem. Like you cannot publish without bumping the major version number if you make a breaking change. It's really, really nice. Makes things a lot easier to upgrade. Um, we also saw these like super fast builds. Um, again, that's something that just really, really never gets old. Um, and the last thing that's kind of cool about this is that it turns out the overhead on this is like negative. Like you would think, okay, we're doing all this extra stuff, we're like compiling to JavaScript, we got this runtime, so surely we would end up with like bigger applications. But actually it's the opposite. So this is um, the different real world applications, uh, like the Vue.js one, the Angular, the React one, and the Elm one. They're all the same spec, they're all this doing the same front end, they have the same logic, same styles, same back end. The only difference is what front-end technology was used to, to build them. And it turns out that the compiled asset size, which is something relevant if you've got users on mobile and you you're care about the initial page load time, um, the Elm one is just like by far the smallest. So it turns out that just because it's this totally different paradigm, you're, you're able to express things differently and also a lot of optimizations that the compiler does um, that are not necessarily safe to do when you don't have pure functions everywhere and things like that. Um, these have some really, really practical benefits. It's not just like, oh, well, this is an ergonomics thing only. It's like, no, it's ergonomics and performance. So tiny asset bundles are like another thing that uh, people like about Elm. Also, it's just fun. <laughs> like it's just, I, I love programming Elm. Like uh, there's a lot of joy in the Elm community just around like just banging stuff out and making stuff work. It's just like, it's just sort of a cheerful, like happy group of people. Um, so some resources if you're interested in, uh, in learning more about Elm. Um, I always recommend starting with the official guide. This is just on the Elm website. If you go to elmlang.org and walk through the guide, um, it's really well written. It's really complete. Um, it's really nice. Um, 
There's also the Elm Slack. I always recommend people go here, especially the beginner's channel, which is like the default channel you start in. The people there are just like unbelievably helpful to the point where I'm like, I, I just don't even know what to say about how they spend their time because most of what they seem to do is just helping people out on, on this Slack. And I just think we're incredibly lucky to have them um, in our community because they're, they're so unbelievably helpful. Um, last of all, uh, I, I have to mention that uh, <laughs> I made a course on front-end masters. Um, if you're a front-end masters subscriber, um, also uh, Elm in Action, uh, I'm writing a book for Manning. Um, it's an early access, so if you want, you can read the first seven chapters, which are out right now, planning to target 10 chapters. Um, or depending on when you're hearing this, if you're watching it at home, maybe it's already out. So um, uh, have a look at that too. Um, there's also the Elmtown podcast, which has uh, lots of like nice interviews. And it's kind of a cool way to, to keep up with what's going on in the community. Um, that's the URL for it. And finally, uh, meetups. There's meetups all over the world. Um, I, like I said, Elm programmers tend to be a pretty friendly bunch, pretty welcoming to beginners. That's sort of a, a cultural community value. So I would encourage you to take a look in your nearby area and see if there's a meetup. OK. So to sum up, we talked about front-end code bases are growing. This is a trend that shows no sign of reversing. It's just over time, they've gotten more and more complex, in some cases to the point where, with event sourcing, they're the entirety of your logic. They're just getting bigger and bigger. More business logic. Less, uh, as a percentage, uh, layout and visual stuff. Um, certainly more complexity. We need more and more tools to manage this complexity. And just more and more code to write. So how we spend our time is sort of evolving as front-end developers. Um, this, is, this is sort of inevitable, and uh, it's, it's making things sort of get harder. And I would say that new tools ought to challenge our assumptions about like, what it means to be a front-end developer and like, how we spend our time as a front-end developer and what percentage of our time even should be spent in the browser, even though that's the medium that we're targeting. So yeah, I mean, productivity and flow state, why shouldn't they be different now that we have different requirements and, and doing the job is fundamentally different than it used to be? So with the help of modern tools like Elm, it's entirely possible we could even be building UIs faster in the dark. Thanks very much. So we have some time for questions, um, but uh, I'll let, I don't want to ca keep everybody captive, so uh, we'll just do those off stage. Uh, so just if you'd like to have, ask a question, just stop on by. Thanks very much. <laughs>